Good morning, Faith Church. It's good to be with you this morning. I've enjoyed the worship. What a wonderful atmosphere to come to church and worship the Lord today. I feel very honored to be with you this morning at Faith Church. I'm here because Pastor Kelly held a gun to my head, and no, he really didn't, but he just said, would you, uh, would you come and speak for us on this particular Sunday? And don't they look like they're having a rough time? But we're very glad to, uh, to have known um, them over the years. My name is Terry Stone. My wife, Debbie, was not able to be with me today, but we retired back in March of uh, senior pastoring and after 19 years, as Pastor Kelly said, and uh, we have moved to Coweta. We're living in Coweta now, and so uh, we've been in ministry for some 40-plus years, and uh, we're enjoying some time from that particular position. I would like to say that we, we uh, have known and loved your pastor and wife and family for many, many years many years during a special time in our lives, uh, we attended Broken Arrow Assembly with Brother Tom Goins as senior pastor, and Kelly happened to be the youth pastor. He became the youth pastor for our children for about four years, and the church at Tahlequah opened up, and uh, we wound up at that church. It used to be First Assembly of God. If you've ever heard of Tahlequah 2911 Church, that's the same church. Uh, We changed the name from First Assembly to 2911 because of Jeremiah 2911, where God said, I know the plans I have for you. Anybody know that verse? Plans for good and not for evil, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. How many believe we have hope in Jesus today? Amen. So I've got great admiration for the Goins family and... um, Pastor Kelly and Lisa, they have been wonderful friends of ours for a long, long time, some of our dearest friends in life, and I would like to compliment this church, how you've come together and you've made this a beautiful place, a comfortable place to worship. You've put it all together to glorify God and honor Him, and I'm telling you, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Would you do me a favor, right off the bat, would you put your hands together and do some crazy praise for Jesus? Would you praise Him right now? Come on. Yeah. Praise God. Oh, that makes a preacher want to preach. Open your Bibles, if you would, please to the ninth chapter of John, or your Bible apps on your phones, the ninth chapter of John. I'm going to read our text this morning, verses 10 and 11 is going to come from God's Word translation, so if you want to change to that on your phones, you can do so. John chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, let's read from those verses, and it says, They asked, Who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you today. Thank you for this privilege to be with these wonderful people here at Faith Church. And we ask now that you will send that special Holy Spirit anointing upon this preacher. And let that anointing flow over this audience, touching every heart that's seated here today. And help us, O God, to have a greater understanding of who Jesus is and what he can do in our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And let everybody say with me, amen. This account here in John chapter 9 begins with Jesus and his disciples walking along the road, and they see this blind man sitting alongside the road. The disciples ask Jesus if this man was blind because he had sinned or because his parents had sinned. You know, back in olden days, back before their times, They were taught that all sickness was due to some specific sin. Of course, at times, 
Sickness does result from a serious sin, but that's not always the case. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, Scriptures declare that we are living in a fallen world, which is a direct result of sin from the Garden of Eden on. Presently, we all uh, suffer with hurts. We all are suffering from injuries in one way or another. We all suffer from hardships from time to time. That's just part of life. But thank God, this world one day will become what God intended because Jesus is coming soon. And one day, very soon, Jesus is going to do away with all sin, sickness, and pain And He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we will rejoice in eternity with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Can somebody say amen? So when answering the disciples' question, Jesus says, no. He was not born blind because of His sin. And it's not the fault of His parents either. And so they returned the question, then why was He born blind? Jesus' answer is very unique. Jesus said that the works of God should be revealed in him. That the works of God should be revealed in him. You know, sometimes suffering is permitted because of the divine purpose to display God's mercy or love or show that even evil has to give way to the power of God's glory in a particular situation. So I want you to follow along with me this morning as we see that blind faith produces insight. Blind faith produces insight. Turn to your neighbor there and say that with me, okay, to them. Blind faith produces insight. And just remember that. Blind faith produces insight. Jesus was a man of purpose. He was a man of resolve. He knew what the problem was at this particular time, and he had a clear understanding of what needed to be done. So with this blind man's condition, Jesus immediately stopped his traveling. He went right over to the blind man. He met the blind man's need, and he used it as a teaching point. What did Jesus do with this blind man? The Bible tells us that he stooped over, he spit took some of the dirt and rubbed it in the saliva and formed mud or clay. Then he took that concoction, went over to the blind man, and he rubbed it on the blind man's eyes. Cool, huh? Then he told that blind man, now go wash that off. Go to the pool of Siloam. That was something Jesus never did to any other person. Now don't miss Don't miss what Christ is teaching even us today. Jesus, you see, is not merely interested in healing a man's physical eyes, although that is certainly part of this story. But the deeper meaning is that symbol that Jesus used in performing this miracle. He spits on the ground and he forms mud or clay, puts that mud or clay on the blind man's eyes, Why mud? Why clay? What does that symbolize? Well, in Genesis, we are told that God formed man from the dust of the ground, from the clay of the earth. When you turn over in the Scriptures to Jeremiah chapter 18, we can see God as a divine potter at the potter's wheel. Verses 3 through 6 says it like this, So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, and the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. What does that mean? What it means is there's a spiritual significance in this passage to let us know today that God wants to mold us, and He wants to shape us as it seems best for His will. Why is that? Because we are the work of the hands of Almighty God. Say that with me. We are the work of the hands of Almighty God. He is the potter. 
We are the clay. And Jesus knew what the blind man was made of. Earthly clay. Dirt. Same as us. Turn to somebody beside you and tell them, hello, dirt. How come you said that louder than you said the other thing? <laughs> hello, dirt. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What does that mean? It means that we are all clay pots. You know, clay's not a very powerful substance. Clay's fragile. Clay can easily break. We are jars of clay. But if you have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a treasure inside of you. We have this treasure in these jars of clay. Why? To show others that to live a righteous life is from God and not from something we do. We, as His clay jars, are to give God the glory and praise and honor. We, as His clay jars, are to be ready at a second's notice to give praise and glory to God. How about it? What can we do right here in this service this morning? Right now, let's stop this sermon right now. Let's put our hands together again, and let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Clay pots. Man, I, I love this story in the Bible. I love it. It has so much spiritual truth woven all throughout it. Jesus heals this blind man's eyes, and he's showing that this man didn't just need physical sight healed, but he needed spiritual eyesight. Let me tell you this morning, you don't just need a physical healing. You need a spiritual healing. You need God to touch your heart. The fallen nature of mankind with sin all around us, the liberal attitudes of this culture, the moral compromises, the lack of discernment between truth and error, it's a hindrance to us today, just like it was back then. So we need healing, just like in the U.S. Senate. We need healing, just like in the U.S. government. We need healing in every church in the land. We need healing that can only come from the power of Jesus Christ. Here's another thing. Jesus would make sure that this blind man would obey him. That's called blind faith. He made sure this blind man would obey him before he would receive his sight. I want you to go there with me in your mind for just a moment. Jesus sends this blind man to the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means sent. He was being sent to sent. He was being sent to the pool of Siloam. Now, that was not going to be an easy trip for him. The blind man had to walk on a path that was filled with rocks and crevices and rough places and bushes, not an easy path, especially for somebody who couldn't see. So why that kind of instruction? Well, you know, sometimes Jesus may surprise us with certain instructions to obey him. Jesus may have a difficult path for you to walk on before you get what you so desperately need. What we've got to understand this morning is that problems are not designed to crush us, but to crowd us to Jesus. God's ways are not our ways. God's plan is for us to be like Jesus. We are to live like Jesus lived. Remember what Jesus told his disciples, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So it's only when the blind man gets to the pool that his true inner sight would be granted. It was difficult. It was a difficult walk for the blind man, but the man was willing to do whatever Jesus told him to do. Question, are you willing to obey Jesus today? Are you willing to obey Jesus? Physical eyesight can easily be performed by the power of Jesus. He can perform miracles just at the drop of a hat, just in a second's time, just without even doing anything, just speaking the word. He can perform miracles. 
But opening spiritual eyes takes obedience by the receiver to overcome the obstacles that get in our way. So it's only as that process is completed and people come to the washing of the mud off of our eyes where we will see who Jesus is. Our spiritual eyes will be opened. When the man went to the pool of Siloam and he washed the mud off of his eyes, the Scripture tells us his sight was cleared up and he would see for the very first time. It was the blind man's obedient faith, blind faith, that pushed him to follow Jesus' instruction. You know, there's a real need in our culture today for more obedient faith in God and less human reasoning. We're living in a day of such advanced technology and higher levels of scientific intellect than mankind has ever known. But we are at that point where our nation is relying more and more on its own strengths instead of the one who has the power to cleanse our hearts. Blind, obedient faith. So as we're living in these final days, just before the coming of Jesus, we need to learn the importance of simple faith again. Simple obedience to the Lord again. Oh, the world says, I'll believe it when I see it. But God is clearly calling to us to believe it without seeing it first so that we can tell others about God's power in our lives. Blind faith produces insight. Well, as this narrative continues through chapter 9, people see that this man is no longer blind. This is where it really gets cool. This man was no longer blind. His neighbors, those who knew him as being blind since birth, questioned him. How were your eyes opened? Who healed you? How did this happen? Well, the man they called Jesus... He made mud and spread it over my eyes, and he told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. So I went and I washed, and now I see. Simple, cut and dried, right? So they bring this man before the religious leaders. Anybody see a problem here coming? The Pharisees questioned him also. Same type of questions, and he gave them the same answer. He put mud on my eyes, told me to wash them. I followed his instruction. I washed, and now I see. (coughs) Get his parents in here. So they bring the man's parents in, and they said, Is this your son who was born blind? If so, how does he now see? Well, the parents were afraid somewhat. They didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue, so they answer it like this. Well, we can tell you this much. He is our son, all right. He was blind, all right. He now sees, all right. But don't ask us how. Ask him. So they call the young man back in. They know where the answer is going to be coming from. And so they try to direct his attention to give God the glory. And Jesus is a sinner. Even though the blind man doesn't know who healed him, the Pharisees know who it was. And by this time, they're all too familiar with Jesus because he had been performing miracles and healing folks and setting people free and all casting out devils and all kinds of things up to this point. But what the Pharisees don't see is that the man who used to be blind really is giving God the glory. I don't know if he's a sinner or not, he said, but one thing I do know, once I was blind and now I see. Once I was blind and now I see. Whoo! I've sung a song that had those words in it. Well, immediately a new difficulty arises. 
the difficulty was that this happened on their worship day. Some of the Pharisees repeated a familiar charge. He can't be from God because he's done this thing, say it with me, on the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? So a division developed between the Pharisees and the religious leaders. An argument developed among them. So now we see more resistance developing against Jesus. I want to give you an interesting note. I'm getting ready to come in for a landing here in just a few moments. Just stay with me. Here's an interesting note of this story. One of the familiar charges against Jesus was that he had broken the laws of the Sabbath day. And in their eyes, they believed Jesus had broken the Sabbath again. And they, he had broken it in three different ways. First of all, Jesus spat on the ground and made mud. The rabbis held that it was all right to spit on a rock on the Sabbath day because that would not make mud. But now spitting on the dirt violated the Sabbath because that would make mud. And making mud is work. And work is forbidden on the Sabbath day. Yeah, that's how ridiculous the regulations became. That was the first thing they had against it. Second thing they had was the rabbi said it was forbidden to heal on the Sabbath day. And many of you don't believe with that one either. Wouldn't you want to see somebody healed on the Sabbath day? Wouldn't you want to see somebody come to church who was sick and God heal them? Man, wouldn't that be great? But they said if you find somebody with a broken leg... You can keep it from getting worse, but you cannot make it better on that day. Jesus did a lot of his healing miracles on the Sabbath day. Remember the man with a withered hand? Stretch forth your hand. This was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Stretch forth his hand. All that made those religious leaders upset. Remember the woman who was bent over? She had been that way for 18 years. Jesus went over to her and straightened her up. All oh, that upset the religious leaders. Here he is healing this blind man on the Sabbath day. Third thing Jesus did was to use saliva. Or in American English, we would call it spit. Okay. There's another instruction in the rabbinical literature. That spit could not be used because spit is medicine. So the use of medicine was forbidden on the Sabbath because that too was a form of work. Think with me for just a moment. Just how ridiculous the reasoning of the Pharisees was. They were going to argue what, what Jesus did for that blind man was valid or not because what you thought he ought to do or not do on the Sabbath, like, that's like giving somebody a beautiful diamond ring and having it rejected because the box it came in was made of plastic. What? But notice through all of this, that blind man's spiritual insight had been growing. The Pharisees ask his opinion about Jesus, and now he says, if this man were not from God, he couldn't do anything. In other words, he must be from God. So the Pharisees' problem was not really with the blind man, was it? Their problem was with Jesus. How many knows that today there's a lot of people that have a problem with Jesus? The Pharisees got really upset, and in their arrogance, they told that man, you were completely born in sins, and you are teaching us? So because he won't discredit Jesus, the Pharisees throw him out of the synagogue. Now, he's excommunicated from worship at church because he believed in the power of God. You know, there's a lot of people today that are afraid to say anything about the Lord. They're afraid to witness for God because they think they'll be dragged into a theological argument 
that will be over their heads or something. But to witness is simply doing what this man did, saying what Jesus did for you. That's all. Just to tell somebody that Jesus set me free from sin. That's a witness. Once I was blind, but now I see. That's what a witness is. You are the world's greatest authority. Young folks, you are the world's greatest authority on your campus. You are the world's greatest authority of what the Lord has done for you. You don't know like I know what He's done for me. And when you use blind faith and you obey the instruction of Jesus, you will receive spiritual insight and your belief system will deepen and grow in your relationship with God. Belief. Belief is linked to divine truth. You see, the Christian life is not built on feelings or impressions that shift from one generation to the next. It's not built on emotions and how you feel one day and how you don't feel the next. It's not built on moods. The Christian life is not built on moods. But Christianity is based on historical life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that will produce spiritual insight and belief in the Holy Scriptures. I'm thankful today to come to this stage and share with you my belief. And hopefully, you too will have a great belief system where you will have spiritual insight in what God has done for you. In closing... I know this is a little different type of sermon, maybe a little more of a pastoral sermon, but I'm trying to preach to every age group today. I want everybody to understand the theme of this message. I want to share two things with you as I close that impacted and blessed my heart as I read them. First of all, I want you to notice the progression of the blind man's faith and spiritual sight. How this seeing man progressed in his understanding about Jesus. Watch this. He first mentioned in verse 11 that Jesus is a man, the man called Jesus. Then he mentions in verse 17 that Jesus is a prophet. Then Jesus is one worth following, verse 27 And then over in verse 33, all in this same story, he mentions that Jesus is from God. So let's say this together. Repeat after me. Jesus is a man. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is worthy of following. And Jesus is from God. Now say wow (laughs) and give the Lord praise again. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think about that. You'll shout a little bit after a while. That's the first thing I wanted to share with you. Here's the second thing I want to close with. Verse 35 in the New International Version says it like this. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, out of the synagogue. And when he found him, when Jesus found him, Jesus hunted up that man, and he found him. I want you to listen to me, friend. Jesus will seek you out. In his mercy, Jesus will find you. Jesus will come to you. He may find you going down the road in your car, your pickup. He may find you in the store, in the mall, at the gas station. He may find you in your office, in the football stadium, the basketball arena. Jesus may come to you in the wee hours of the night when you were in good deep sleep and you woke up and Jesus began to speak to your heart. 
He may search for you. But listen carefully. When Jesus seeks for you, he will find you. A song today says, there's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety and nine. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now watch this. Here's the spiritual point of all of this. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. When the man who was formerly blind was given sight, he tells of the one he knew as he knew him. And as Jesus talked to that healed man, he began to worship Jesus. And that's the turning point. The point that we all need to get to today, regardless of our ages. Now the man is seeing not only with his physical eyes, but now he's seeing with his heart, spiritually. I've asked Mark to lead us this morning in the, in the old chorus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Once this man really knew Jesus, once he really saw Jesus with his heart, the Bible says that he began to worship Jesus for who he was, not just for what he could do or what he did. What if I told you today, what if I told you today that the reason you need to be a Christian is not because of what Jesus can do for you, but simply because of who Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the healer of your heart. Jesus is the saver of your soul. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Pastor Kelly said, preach any way you feel like preaching and conclude any way you feel like concluding. And so I'm going to conclude in my way, what I'm familiar with, the way I feel like I need to do. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, everybody. Blind faith produces insight. Excuse me if I've gotten a little emotional. I tell you, I get to talking about Jesus, what he's done for me. And i got to get a little emotional because my heart begins to melt. And I begin to hear somebody, amen, here, sprinkle praise the Lord or hallelujah over here. When this guy kicks the music, the team gets ready to go. I get excited because Jesus saved me. I'm saved. Think about it today. We do walk through tough situations in our lives, don't we? 
How have the dark times of life prepared you for a deeper relationship with Jesus? When you come through those hard times with stronger faith in Christ, what it does is it causes you to have the testimony that the blind man had. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. 